Hello, everyone. I hope everyone's doing great this evening, and welcome to Horizon's monthly webinar. This month, we are going to be covering five critical report writing mistakes to avoid with Horizon. In case uh, people here are new to our webinar series, my name is Brian, and it's great to see so many of you in attendance. Just to let everyone know, we have a special guest presenter today. Mr. Alan Carson will be helping out on the Q&A panel about report writing mistakes and a new feature we've got coming up. So we have uh, some excellent Q&A time coming up as well for this session. Now, today's segment will be broken into three sessions. And the first part of our segment today will be a review of the actual critical report writing mistakes. And then that's going to be followed by a Q&A, as I just mentioned, from our guest panelist, Alan Carson, who's president of Carson Dunlop. And then we're going to cap off today's session with a new feature alert. We actually have an incredible new feature called Action List, which is an on-demand agent negotiation tool that is completely free to Horizon users, and it's something you'll be able to take advantage of. So for those interested, stay tuned. And after the Q&A period, you can learn more about Action List. Before we actually get into the mistakes themselves, I would first like to introduce a term that we call report noise. What exactly is report noise? Well, report noise is unnecessary or vague information that doesn't add value to the report. It makes the report longer and harder to read which causes you, the inspector, to spend more time writing. It can increase your liability and ultimately should be avoided at all costs. So we're going to explore how report noise affects the report in all three sections, our descriptions, limitations, and recommendations, as well as a few other mistakes that are very common in our experience here with our own reports and ones that we've seen other Horizon users make. So without further ado, we're going to jump right into mistake number one and see how report noise can affect the description. Now, often the description contains too much narrative on items that are largely un unimportant, or it mistakenly details deficiencies and limitations, none of which it's ultimately designed for. These unnecessary comments we would consider report noise. The description should be nothing more than a summary of components, materials, and general system-related information or statements. Let's look at a few examples of report noise in the description. The first of which is, this is a two-story, four-bedroom house. All right, doesn't really add extra to the report. Or, the swimming pool is located in the backyard, as opposed to the front yard. Or we have a uh, stairwell lighting controlled by three-way switches. Or overflow noted on kitchen sink. Granule loss noted on the shingles, which is discussing a defect. Or adding in flooring, two-way joist, 16 inches OC. Technical terms that no one really cares about, or for the most part, will understand. In reading these comments, you'll see that they don't actually provide further clarity on a topic, some are misplaced, maybe even reference a defect, and overall, none enhance a reader's understanding of the report, really only, light, pardon me, really only add to its length and complexity. Let's compare those statements to a few that are contrasting and provide some value to the client. I've got four here, one of which will go over the structure, say attic insulation, upgraded windows and how it improves the house's energy efficiency, or just when you encounter a roof that's in great condition and you've got no recommendations, a good summary of its condition. Let's go ahead and take a look. The structure has performed well with no significant movement, or the attic insulation is consistent with modern standards. The newer windows help improve comfort and energy efficiency, the roof covering is newer and in good condition. 
Comparing these comments, you can see that they don't really repeat what's already listed in the description, which again is typically a checklist of these items, but they go and enhance the reader's understanding and better position these items through the sentence structure and what they're trying to explain. So if you are thinking about adding comments to the description, which is not a problem, really consider the value of that statement before adding it in and look at these statements in contrast to what you might be adding for ideas on how you may structure your description comments. One of the things that we do here at Horizon for a best practice with our inspectors to avoid this report noise in the description is to primarily treat the description as a checklist for documenting basic system information only. That's like the roof type and material or exterior wall surface and trim full stop. And we suggest that you use SpeedWrite to achieve this. Do it on site with Horizon Mobile or post inspection on Horizon Web. This will prevent you from adding unnecessary comments and can help you by completing all the descriptions as well as limitations in less than 15 minutes per report. Now when it comes to actually entering comments, we suggest that you save that for the proofreading process. Once you've entered all the data, ideally through SpeedWrite, while you're reviewing the report, if you find an item that you really feel a comment is critical, you can edit and include that comment at that time. Remember, our system also has a storage of your most recently used comments. So as you start developing your comment database, you can repurpose older comments on newer inspections. You can use the comment as is or modify and continue to expand your database. So the benefit of adding the comments also post inspection is that you have not only the ability to compose your thoughts more clearly and without a client nearby, but you can reuse ones that you might have used in the past. We always say to our inspectors, before writing a comment, ask yourself, what value does this statement add to the report and how does it help my client? Moving along to our second mistake, we're going to explore how report noise also can affect limitations. Now, our first example is, we don't check alarms. This statement is factually true for many inspectors. However, it may come off poorly and interpreted differently. Consider if you had said it, or wrote it rather, a professional home inspection does not include an evaluation of a security or alarm system. Technically, you're saying the exact same thing. You won't inspect the alarm system. But it does so in a more professional manner and explains why the alarm system is not to be inspected. It falls outside the scope, as opposed to you simply not wanting to test the alarm system. And this could easily be the client's perception with the previous comment by explaining why you can't or won't inspect something goes a long way to a client's understanding of a limitation and their appreciation of it. Our next example concerns the crawl space. Let's go ahead and take a look here. Access was not gained to the crawl space. All right, so what does that mean to the client? How could it potentially impact them as future homeowners? With your statements specifically about limitations, you should give a course of action. Don't be afraid to write in some directive and do more than just point form. Compare it to the following statement. Access to the crawl space should be gained to check the structure, electrical, plumbing, heating, insulation, etc. This statement provides a clear course of action for the client to follow and explains why it should be done. This is how you should be detailing and explaining limitations that you encounter either inherently on site, situationally, or that are just part of your standards that you like to list in your report. Let's take a look at one more example here, which was similar to the crawl space. Roof was inaccessible. Maybe it was a flat roof. Maybe it was just too high or steep. Well, if it was too high or steep, you should be including that perhaps within the commentary. But again, 
What does this statement mean to the client and how could it impact them? In contrast to this, no access was gained to the roof. A full evaluation by a specialist is recommended to provide more information about the condition of the roof. In the same vein as our previous example of the crawl space, by providing a clear course of action, your client understands what they need to do and how they should undertake it and the importance of doing so. As opposed to the description, which again, we are more in favor of simply utilizing as is without any embellishment, your limitations, when encountered, you should give an explanation for them. It doesn't have to be super long, but it should be clear, concise, and give them directive. For our inspectors, the Horizon best practice is first and foremost, you search in real time during their inspections on Horizon Mobile. This allows them to document anything that they encounter as a limitation or prevention to the inspection in real time. They can also take photographs of that limitation, which are already in the report. Now, if you don't utilize Horizon Mobile, not a problem. You can still document things utilizing search on Horizon Web, making it much easier than doing the hunt and peck through the systems themselves. But by documenting the things that you encounter in real time and taking photographs, you're going to have that information for when you're back at the computer and you can then compose your thoughts, establish a statement, or reuse one that you might have done in the past. Situations that search would be beneficial in real time for that we commonly may encounter, say storage or a car in the garage, solar panels or deck covering the roof, perhaps you're unable to remove the electric panel cover for a specific reason, all of which you may choose to document with photographs. We also suggest that uh, you explain a course of action and why it's important. Don't just simply stipulate the limitation itself. You want to give them more than we couldn't do this or we don't do that. Why couldn't you? Why can't you? And why should I care? What should I do about it? And lastly, for your standard limitations, like how you inspected the roof or which plumbing components are not inspected, you should use SpeedWrite. These things fall outside of the scope of what you would typically document with photographic evidence, but they are still part of your required item list, and in turn, the best thing to do is accomplish filling them out through SpeedWrite. Hate to sound like a broken record, but in order of efficiency and accuracy, if you can fill out all of your standards of practice, limitations, and descriptions using SpeedWrite, you'll find that you enter less comments, your reporting's more accurate, more consistent, you spend less time doing it, and your comments will be where they should be under your recommendations and things that really prevent parts of the inspection. Moving along, we're now at mistake three, which covers report noise and our recommendations. The most common mistake when it comes to report noise in the recommendation section is the overuse of my items instead of the default database. Not only does this add a tremendous amount of work for you, the inspector, on-site or back at the computer, it ultimately just is too time-consuming for you to be able to improve the efficiency of your work. So you want to try to get out of the mindset and approach of using my items in favor of using the database items. And I'll show you a few examples that I've encountered recently in our own inspector's reports where they favored the use of a my item instead of using the default database. And one of the things you have to learn is just a matter of our vernacular or terminology, which will make the search function even easier for yourself. So these issues won't arise so much. Our first example here is a my item Missing, loose, or torn, roofing shingles are observed. Evaluate and remedy as needed by a qualified roofer. I'm going to break this down into a couple components. The first of which is missing, loose, and or torn roof shingles are observed. So this is a component and the defect. Sometimes you say things were observed, sometimes not. In my opinion, that should be admitted since it's obvious to the client. There's no implication for this one. 
Looking at the second part, this is the task. If the shingles are missing, loose, or torn, they need to be repaired or replaced. Full stop. That's what you're getting paid is the evaluation and determining what they should be doing. So in this case, we would repurpose that into using the Horizon database with one of our standard items. You can see that it's nicely structured where you have our component, sloped roof asphalt shingles, the condition, the implication, which is automatically included with our standard items, and then the structure of our location, task, time. And I know many inspectors won't include cost estimates, but if you're willing, also the cost. It provides a uniformity that my items don't necessarily offer. And furthermore, when it comes to issues that you may want to over-explain yourself because you feel that clients may not understand, well, that's where, my apologies, I went back a screen, that's where, our condition links to more information prove very useful. For the end user, they click on that link and they get a reference article. They can read this and educate themselves. This hopefully minimizes the amount of calls you get about questions of the report and for you to explain this or that. Furthermore, it eliminates you from having to write out extensive explanations on things that we've already addressed for you. Looking at another example here, we have lights are not functioning. This may be a result of a bad bulb, test with new bulb, and remedy if needed. Well, lights are not functioning. This is a component and a defect. This may be a result of a bad bulb, test with new bulb, and remedy if needed. This includes a possible cause. This goes beyond most standards and is not addressed in most recommendations. It also includes two tasks, try a new light bulb and make repairs if needed. I'm not sure the sentence would be clear to most homeowners. What do you think? Again, compare this to if you use the Horizon database and get comfortable with selecting the items within it, you have our component, condition, implication, location, task, time. You'll notice that if I don't include cost, it's not present here. And again, a link to more information, saving me the time and hassle from typing out explanations when Horizon does it for you. Furthermore, going into another example here, you may have something along the lines of tree limbs should be trimmed away from roof covering to prevent aggregate loss. And oftentimes the reason why you may be resulting in creating a my item for these is that you tend to not necessarily search for the right word or think of how the database is built. You always want to think of the defect and component secondary. So in this case, first and foremost, I'm not going to split this into two because this includes a component, task, and implication. The problem is assumed. The implication in this case is also specific to asphalt shingles. In my opinion, most clients would not understand the term aggregate loss. So again, it's technical jargon for most people. In contrast to our system, we have it neatly laid out. You'll notice though that this condition, which in some cases many people would say is self-explanatory, doesn't include a link to more information. And you're right, we're not going to explain that, that uh, a tree branch touches the roof can be problematic in a secondary article when it already explains it here. But what we will do is help illustrate things. You can see here that automatically included within this report is an illustration about trees and shrubs too close to the house. Everyone knows the age-old expression, a photo or a painting is worth a thousand words. We've got it right here to help take that burden of entering those thousand words for you. So we're going to move along now to our fourth mistake, which is using technical jargon and not writing to your audience. I've got my uh, trusty doctor here. And imagine sitting in the surgeon's office they turn to you and say, 
you require surgery for the elimination of a bone lesion and arthroscopic anterior stabilization repair. And I can barely say that clearly. How much of that would you understand? Because the reality is when my doctor told me that, I said, you're going to stick what? Where exactly? And then he broke it down for me. And we'll compare it to what he explained afterward. You require surgery to remove a piece of broken bone from your shoulder and repair its stability. Now, to be honest with you, wasn't sure what I liked most, not knowing or knowing what had to be done, but it speaks volumes to your situation as an inspector as well. When people tend to use technical jargon in any trade or vocation and you're sitting on the opposite end of it, it doesn't feel too good. Often leaves you a bit dumbfounded, sometimes frustrated, and the reality is if the person speaking to you just understood how to convey those thoughts in a more clear and everyday manner, I'm sure both of you would have a much better interaction. The same holds true with your knowledge. As inspectors, you can have a wide variety of knowledge on a number of different topics coming into the industry from construction backgrounds to engineering. And with that experience, you may have talked with a number of tradespeople or engineers and that lingo is commonplace not to the person potentially hiring you to have the inspection done. So you want to be mindful of that and, you know, the trade speak, you want to try to duck it down and, you know, use that sort of common day bedside manner. So what we consider report noise and technical jargon lends to a few things. It is you know, vague information or trying to reference code, things like that, that someone like myself who isn't a trades person or doesn't have that much of an extensive trades background may not inherently know what they're meaning. So in this case, let's look at our first example. The balcony railing openings violate the building code. Well, ask yourself, how does it violate building code? Why should it matter to your client? What should be done to fix the issue? Well, let's compare it to a revised statement. The large openings between railing spindles may present a safety hazard. Reduce the opening width to 4 inches maximum to improve safety. You can see the contrast in statements and how we hit all three of our questions there, addressing the concerns, course of action, and a reasoning for our client to care. Another example we have here is some of the exterior plugs should be upgraded to have ground fault protection excuse me, ground fault protection, which was mandated at time of construction. Ask yourself, plugs? Why not outlets or receptacles? Sure, some people in the electrical industry may reference it as plugs, but most people certainly think of it as a plug, as what you plug into the outlet, not the receptacle itself. And what is ground fault protection anyways? Furthermore, why should they do it? Because it was mandated? Let's compare it to all exterior outlets should be upgraded to have ground fault, circuit interruption, GFCI protection to help prevent chance of electric shock or fire. Again, addressing all the necessary concerns there, giving them the course of action as in the statement, not necessarily just referencing ground fault protection, but by giving them the full name and the abbreviation, you can provide, perhaps provide more information through one of our reference articles, or they can look online for more information about GFCIs. In actuality, this comment would be tied in with a recommendation, just like we were reviewing in mistake three, and GFCI would reference a more information article, especially if it said that there was no GFCI present. That is a safety concern, something many people would consider adding to their summary page, and I assure you that we have an article that references that. So this comment, in the large part, can even be redundant, but it is something that you could supplement the recommendation with. As far as horizon best practices, our inspectors try to avoid technical jargon and they write to the audience by avoiding terms like reverse polarity, backdrafting, truss, swale, none of which most people would understand. 
and they rely on Horizon's built-in articles and illustrations to explain complex terms and issues. They keep their comments succinct, and they use proper word choice and sentence structure, all of which can be easily overlooked in the interest of just trying to get things done quicker. This is also why I go back to positioning the commenting portion or report writing element of your reports to post inspection when you're not dealing with a client so you can either compose your thoughts more clearly or again reuse comments that you might have purposed in the past. Remember, we are writing to communicate, not intimidate. That moves us on to our fifth and final reporting mistake for tonight, which is not reporting to client preferences. It can often be a struggle for inspectors to separate their own preferences on what a report should contain to that of what appeals to their target audience. Attention spans have shrunk by over 50% in the past decade to roughly five minutes. Coupled with the social media age we are currently living in, where information is now commonly supplied in snippets of 280 characters or less, and that on average, only 28% of the words on a web page are typically read, means that you as an inspector getting a client to read your report is a long hurdle and struggle. So less is more. Now, Carson Dunlop, we recently surveyed 3,500 of our customers. And their feedback has helped us develop the reporting style that not only they use, but Horizon itself is shaped by. <coughs> Excuse me, is shaped by. Now, although the results might not speak to your preference on reporting style, they do provide valuable insight into what customers and their agents alike will expect and demand out of your report. Survey says, 99%. Tell me why it's important. You're the expert here. 98% prioritize significant issues of a safety or cost standpoint, and you should simply add them to your summary page, highlighting these for your client over non-critical ones. Headings help, and remember our reports are a PDF, and when you get to the headings, you can click on them to easily navigate to any se section of the report. 97% of our respondees said, tell me what to do. Remember, it's, getting, it's what you're getting paid to do. So give them some directive as that is your clear-cut job. 96% executive summary. Summarize the important items for them so they don't have to hunt and peck throughout the entire report. And that lends itself to the 98% of prioritizing issues. They don't want to have to go through the entire report to see what the most critical items are. That's where the executive summary page comes into play. They can read through the rest of the report to find out if some paint needs to be redone or some caulking, but if the roof needs to be reshingled, that should be on the summary page. 93% wanted you to include cost estimates. Now, I know this is a bit far-fetched for most and understandable if this is one that you simply don't add to your reporting style, but if you can add cost estimates, your clients will certainly appreciate it. 92% said illustrations are helpful, and we have 1,700 that get automatically included within your reports. So remember that when you preview, you're going to get to see those illustrations. And we even have the ability where you can search the database and add them to items of your own. Now, for the most part, we're going to have the illustration for the item that you already need. But if you're creating a My Item and you'd like to supplement that with one of our illustrations, you can easily add that to your My Item and have it permanently added when you select that item. So this way, you have master control over what you're getting included within your report. 88% short report with reference available. And you know what? At the report publishing screen, there's an option where you can include the home reference book. Over 200 plus pages of great self-help information broken down by systems and critical information that you can include free of charge for all clients. They can access it from the report at any time great, great information, and it helps you also not have to over-explain yourself in the body of the report. 87% said photos are good. 
They can certainly be worth that thousand words, but only if used appropriately. Don't treat your report like a picture book. You will save yourself some time and your clients will appreciate it. And our last pulley response was 81% for point form better than narrative. Save the XF narrative, give yourself back that wasted time, so that way you can get back to enjoying your life a bit sooner. Remember, less is more, at least for 81% of our respondees. And when it comes to Horizon best practice with our inspectors, the survey results speak for themselves. Clients want a short report that includes a recommendations of, pardon me, that includes a summary of prioritized recommendations with clear, concise messaging on what to do and why it should be done, supplemented with photos and visual aids, and if possible, include cost estimates. So by taking in to consideration all of these wants and the weight that our respondees gave to them, you know that as long as you start adhering to some of the basic fundamentals of our Horizon system, which I'm sure many, if not all of you already are, avoiding some of the pitfalls that we went over today, making sure that your recommendations are a bit more thorough and fleshed out, your limitations explain a clear course of action, and your description, for the most part, is a checklist, you're going to find that your reports are better received by your clients, the agents will appreciate them more, and at the end of the day, you're probably going to get through things a bit quicker. Clients want the key messages clear, short, and sweet. I'll leave you with, do you reports deliver? So folks, I really appreciate everyone attending our webinar portion today. I now would like to open up the floor for any questions. And again, Mr. Carson, our panelist, will be certain to address any questions that you have about report writing mistakes or reporting. All you have to do is type them into the chat window. I will be glad to address those questions one at a time, or, or more specifically, Alan will. And then again, after that, we will be addressing the action list. And the action list is our newest feature, which is available to everyone as of today. So I just received a question about why, and again, this is a question, why should we uh, further explain that course of action? So uh, in the database, for example, if you select, say, solar panel covering roof, why is it important to you know, elaborate a little bit further on what the client should do as a follow-up course of action? Uh, so that's a question we just got in through. I'm not sure if you'd be able to uh, address that there, Mr. Carson. Absolutely, and uh, it's a great question. Some of the limitations are self-explanatory, and it's kind of like uh, we have to give implications when they're not self-evident. And uh, I would say we do the same thing um, when it comes to uh, limitations. And when you want to address a limitation, that identifies something you couldn't do, but you want to go ahead and tell people to do it, you might even include that in the recommendations. I don't think clients pay as much attention to the limitations heading as they do to the observations and recommendations or recommendations heading or whatever you call it. So uh, I would go a step further, and particularly with uh, the attic and crawl space areas being inaccessible, and Brian did a good job of saying you should tell people not only to get access to them, but to uh, make sure there are no problems with structure, plumbing, 
heating, electrical, insulation in the crawl space, for example. So there's a court case in Ontario where the home inspector said couldn't get into the crawl space. And there was a whole bunch of issues in the crawl space. And the judge said, well, the home inspector didn't really explain to the client why it was important that he didn't get into the crawl space and so held the inspector's feet to the fire. So it's pretty sensible to, if you think there's going to be an issue, document the limitation, but I would also make a recommendation and uh, go a step further. Now, solar panels covering part of the roof, I wouldn't necessarily go that step further. That one is pretty much self-evident. You obviously couldn't look at the, uh, the roof under the solar panels. Um, so you've got to use some common sense, and uh, where you're at risk is the big ticket items, as I say, the attic and the crawl space. Can't see them. Better tell people to get a look and explain why they should get a look. So I hope that helps. Perfect. Excellent. I said definitely do. Uh, another question came through about recommendations. And I know that a number of people, this is a, a big fear thing, and, and obviously it adds liability, but what do you feel the benefit of adding in cost to recommendations, cost estimates, or even using statements like depends on work needed or approach as opposed to one to two thousand dollars? Do you, you know, is that something you feel really is a you know, differentiator, uh, or is it something more along the lines of it's just unique to, you know, it's a unique offering that you can do, but not necessarily going to uh, make or break a report, so to speak? We've always done it, and the the position that we've always taken is that uh, when you think about a client trying to make a decision about buying a house, what's important to you? To say that the house needs a new roof to the average layperson might mean one thousand dollars, five thousand, ten thousand, twenty thousand. They are uh, very often completely at sea, so we have to be careful in saying we're providing a ballpark cost rather than a cost estimate. We're not a contractor providing a quote or an estimate, but we're trying to give people an order of magnitude so that they can make a sensible decision about buying the house and do some planning about what kind of expenses they're going to have. So if I were the client or I were inspecting a house for a favorite relative, I would want them to have as much information as they could to make a sensible decision. and the cost of that to me is a big part of what would affect my decision as to whether to buy a home or what kind of offer to make on it. So is it easy? Absolutely not. Is it valuable to clients? Absolutely is. So uh, from a competitive standpoint in the home inspection sector, uh, can you differentiate yourself and provide a competitive advantage by doing it? Uh, I think in a lot of markets you absolutely can. Um, does it increase your liability? To some extent, although I will tell you after hundreds of thousands of inspections, complaints about the costs being out of line are few and far between. Especially since if you provide a ballpark cost that has a range, and we typically give a range of 100%. So if we think something is going to cost uh, $5,000, we might say, um, 3500 to $7,000. Um, so we're just trying to give an order of magnitude. And generally speaking, with that kind of order of magnitude, you can almost always find somebody to do the work that you've described for that range. So it hasn't been a huge issue for us. I understand how intimidating it sounds, but it's not as bad as you think. Um, there are all kinds of cost estimating books out there. Our life cycles uh, and costs guide provides uh, not a bad benchmark for uh, a huge number of the items that you're going to talk about in your report. Um, there's the Marshall Swift stuff, Dodge, Means, all kinds of cost estimating books. So there are sources out there to draw from. You're still going to have to use some judgment and common sense, but uh, understand it's a bit scary, but pretty valuable for clients. And, and we're pretty focused on providing as much value for our clients as we can. It does help to differentiate us, so it takes a bit of courage, but I think it's uh, worth some serious thought. Excellent. 
great. Uh, if you guys, again, if you have follow-up questions to that, please just simply type them in. I'll be glad to uh, get those questions in as well. Now, another question just came in and talking about the description. And, you know, when the description is getting filled out, there's at times a lot of, uh, for lack of a better word, here they put optional, so we'll, we'll, we'll go with the, the actual word here, optional topics. Like, so we'll take roofing. Everyone's familiar with roofing. It's the first one you're going to see when you open up uh, the system. And you have things like uh, approximate age or typical life expectancy or probability of leakage, things like that. And, you know, a lot of inspectors tend to look at that as obligatory, right? They fill that out in addition to the required items. And what value do you see in that? Or do you think that is something that just simply is not necessarily a waste of time, but it doesn't add the value that perhaps the time they spend, it, it get they get back, right? So like what is the importance of filling out required items versus your optional topics and why shouldn't I fill out those optional topics? Well, and it, that's a great question and a funny thing about Horizon is that a lot of the Horizon database items are put in there because a lot of inspectors have asked for them. Okay. And it's somewhat ironic because at Carson Dunlop we don't believe in including a lot of that kind of stuff. So we leave it out, we hide them. One of the great features about Horizon is if you don't use the topic, uh, probability of leakage is a great example that you mentioned, Brian. Um, we do not put it in our reports. Uh, if we see a risk of leak, uh, we're going to document it. If we see a bad flashing, we see something missing, we see a, a torn valley, we'll document that. Um, but probability of leakage as a broad and general term, um, it's a legacy item, it goes back to early days, I would get rid of it. And you made a great statement that less is more. And if you think about what's important to your client, you're going to make people read your report. If it's got a bunch of stuff in it that doesn't add a great deal of value, you're going to lose their attention pretty quickly. So I strip most of that optional stuff out. If you've got something to say, say it. I'd put it in the observations and recommendations section and give people some direction to do something about it. If it's just filler, you're not adding any great value. You're wasting your client's time, and you sound a little bit like you're writing to listen to yourself talk. So I am a big proponent on stepping around most of that stuff, and I'm it, it's kind of sad and, and unfortunate, but I understand why it is. People look at the Horizon Standard Database and say, that's my starting point. It isn't. It is the all things you might want to use list. And I would really encourage you, and, and if you want to talk about speeding up report writing, one of the great things you can do is spend 45 minutes or an hour and go through and hide all the items that you're not going to use. It makes everything work more quickly for you, whether you're navigating or searching. Get rid of the crap, take out the stuff you don't absolutely need, and then it uh, declutters your input screen and it's going to help declutter your uh, report output as well. Perfect. Got uh, another question here. How do you separate out reporting for an agent versus the client? or you know, catering to the client, right, the person who's paying you versus the agent, either who did the referral or maybe it's first time, but, you know, very likely that agent's going to see a copy of the report. You know, you sort of hope so because at the end of the day, agents are, you know, the driving force for many inspectors as far as their business is concerned. And, uh, so, you know, if agents are favorable to your report, they're probably going to be encouraging their clients to get an inspection through you. But at the same time, they're not your client, right, in that, ge in that general sense. But sometimes, you know, that, that leverage that the agent has can, can uh, weigh on the inspector and be hard for them to report. So what would you, what would you say to that? Well, uh, it's a fascinating question and one that we've agonized over for a lot of years. And, and here's where we've landed. We've said, at the end of the day, if you take a long-term view of your business and understand that you want to be around in 10 years. We have decided that our loyalty isn't really to the uh, client and it's not really to the agent. Our loyalty is to the house. And by that I mean our job is to 
report the condition of the house as accurately as you can based on what you saw. And as soon as you start trying to shade things to keep an agent happy, or on the other side of the coin, we often have clients uh, who have gotten cold feet uh, or their parents or in-laws were going to finance the house and now they're balking. Um, they want you to write an overly harsh report so that they can back out of the deal. We stay away from all of that. At the end of the day, your feet are going to be held to the fire of what's going on in the house and what did your report say. So you have to look forward to somebody saying, hey, this guy didn't report what was in the house. And so you'll get that pressure. And I think you may lose the odd agent along the way. And I'm going to suggest to you those are the agents that you want to lose. The good agents are going to want to take care of their client. And while they're going to be interested in getting that deal go through, at the end of the day, they're going to respect that you provided good information, you had great bedside manner, and as a lot of people say, and it's so true, it's not what you say, it's how you say it. So you can describe the condition of the house without being alarmist, without being overly negative, but being reflective of the condition of the house. Get the message across without terrifying people, but keeping it in perspective so that they understand. And in our experience, all the good agents, and agents are just like everybody else. There's uh, great doctors, not so great doctors. There's great home inspectors, not so great ones. There's great agents and not so great ones. We try to work with the great agents, and uh, we find there's a whole bunch out there who get what we do and absolutely accept and appreciate the fact that we try and reflect the house as we see it. If they disagree with you, they'll bring it up and talk to you, and you can have a discussion about uh, why you see things the way you do. You're going to win that argument nine times out of ten, but if they come up with something that uh, you hadn't thought of or a different piece of information that you didn't have, that may change your opinion. And uh, I would absolutely encourage you to be open-minded enough to change your opinion if somebody presents new information you did not have. So it's, it's a fine line, and when you're trying to build your business, I understand it's tough to stick to your guns when it comes to giving a, a report that agents like, but you've got to look down the road and say you're trying to build a business, and there really is no shortcut to success. You've got you to be straight with the house. Fantastic there. Now, we do have just a quick question here that's more of a technical side, so I'm just going to quickly address this one before we get another question for you, Mr. Carson, there about using speed writing search at the same time. They're really designed to, for two separate parts of the inspection. Search is often utilized for, if we would say, phase one, where you're documenting defects, observations, limitations that you may encounter. Then you would backfill the rest of the report through speed write as you've already spent, say, an hour and a half, two hours on site. You can relatively recall all that information, like the, it's a sloped roof with asphalt shingles, or you know, it was 100 amp service from your memory. So we really designed those two functions to work in simpatico, but one after the other. Search to document your findings, then, which would again be your defects and recommendations, or limitations or preventions to the inspection. Then you backfill your descriptions and those standards of practice limitations, otherwise known as your required items through speed write, which again will ensure that you're answering only what's critical. Ideally, if you do that on site, then you can do it and, and ensure that everything is addressed while you're still on location, but regardless, speed write is available also on the Horizon web platform. Uh, but yeah, it's really ideally used two separate functions, uh, so that way speed write itself is simply for the data entry and search is a more comprehensive tool for actually documenting the entirety of an issue. Uh, so hopefully that addressed that one question there. Now, another question came in about costing. What do you say to just keeping things vague, like major or minor cost, uh, Alan? Well, it's probably better than not doing anything, but when you say major, to one client that might mean $1,000, and to another it might mean 50. So if you're going to put in your report a definition of major and minor, that might be useful, but it really only gives you two data points. And so you might say under $1,000 or more than $1,000. 
But if you're looking at replacing a slate roof or a cedar shingle roof, to say major and say it's anything over $1,000, you run the risk of uh, giving people uh, a poor impression of what the actual cost is going to be. So I'm not a huge fan of it. Um, it's better than nothing, but I think it can actually uh, mislead clients and give them a false sense of security. So I, I'm not a huge fan. Gotcha. Perfect. And what about photos? Now, here's a question about photos and the limitations. So say in case you weren't able to access things, maybe there's heavy storage, uh, would you suggest taking photographs of that, leaving them in the report as a secondary to that question? So should you take photographs of things that you encounter, you know, storage in the garage, no access to the crawl space? You know, a gentleman the other day, I was actually mentioning he saw a black widow spider as he opened the door to the crawl space, and I was like, oh, you know, I've got a bit of a, an arachnophobia, so I, would, I wouldn't even know what a black widow <laughs> looks like. So, but he told me, and I was like, holy cow, I didn't even realize that would be a potential. Uh, he took a photographic nonetheless, and I was like, yeah, I guess you could put that in the report. Um, but what what is your mindset on, A, taking those photos for situations like that? And that may be on a bit of the extreme, but it was actually something I heard just the other day. And then should those photos be included in the report? So my read on that is take the photos by all means and don't put them in the report. Why? Because they don't add any value for the client. And remember, Brian talked earlier, and I absolutely agree, the focus is on giving the client useful information in as concise and clear a manner as possible. Every time you ask them to read a bunch of limitations, it's really noise to them. It's you covering your butt. It doesn't help them make their decision about buying this home. The reason I want you to take the photo is in the one in a thousand, where people call you back and say, hey, there's a half inch crack in the garage floor you didn't identify in your report, then and only then you can pull out the photo that showed the garage filled with uh, boxes and say, remember what uh, the house looked like when we were there? We couldn't get into the garage because it was jammed full. These people were getting ready to move. So that's my strategy. Don't make the client read it but keep it, and the amazing thing about Horizon is you take the photo, you don't have to do a darn thing, it just gets filed automatically for you, it's stored in the cloud with the report and with the work order, it's always at your fingertips if you ever get a question, and making a thousand clients read it because one, one day might have a question about it, to me, not worth it. And it takes time to put it in the report, and you've got to explain it, you put a caption, um, it's it's more work for you. It's unnecessary work for your client. Um, that's where I land on that one. Excellent, there. And what about just including costs for big ticket, the summary items, or should you do it for all recommendations? I don't mind that strategy because it gives you the opportunity to give the client uh, the numbers that matter, and. Uh, I know some inspection companies simply say we're going to document items uh, only if they're over 500 or 1000 or $1,500 or 2000 and some of them even adjust that number based on the price of the house. So if you're looking at a, at a house that's two or $300,000 versus a house that's a uh, million or $2 million, what's major and minor might be different to uh, different homeowners. So. Uh, Putting the uh, prices on the big ticket items, uh, I don't mind. One of the risks in doing that is if there are multiple small costs that add up to a big one, you have to be careful of that. So if windows around the house are in poor repair, replacing one window might be $1,000, $1,500, but replacing 25 windows might be $25,000. So you can see you've got to be careful with that a little bit, but uh, generally speaking, I think that's not a bad way to go. Awesome. Now, say that uh, as opposed to putting cost estimates, or what, maybe what you currently do, is that you reference contacting, so say there's a, maybe a plumbing issue, you say that they should contact a, a plumber for the estimate. Would you favor that over uh, 
doing par ballpark cost, es cost estimates because you know the construction industry you know, prices can change quite quickly. So is it more of a you know err on the side of caution, or would you say that no, I it's still because then you're just you're giving the client more work, so to speak. So is it one of those things where it's either you should either do the cost or not tell them to source the cost out, or what's your sort of mindset toward that? Well, as, as I said, I think the providing costs is the best uh, customer service approach, but if you're not going to do it, I would stay away from, on individual recommendations, tell people to approach a roofer and get a cost for this, approach a plumber and get a cost for that. It makes for repetitive reading. It reinforces the fact that uh, you're not providing as much value as you could. And I see lots of commentary on articles uh, in the media critical about home inspection. And a fairly common thread is, hey, the guy told me to go get experts to look at all this. Why didn't I just uh, bring in a roofer and a plumber and an HVAC guy, an electrician, and be done with it? So I think you want to stay away from that side of it. If you don't give costs, I might give a general comment at the beginning of the report that says something about um, you should get three quotes for uh, any work uh, referenced in the report, understand that costs are going to vary dramatically depending on several factors, and that you should use qualified specialists. I stay away from licensed or master tradesmen or something like that because that doesn't always apply. Um, if you're getting landscaping, uh, probably not an applicable comment, for example. Uh, and so I just say qualified specialist, so I keep it fairly general. And if you're recommending further evaluation, you might be recommending a, an engineer uh, evaluate a structural issue. So qualified specialist, I think, is a, uh, a safe phrase. And it uh, say it once at the beginning, and then don't reiterate it all the way through the report to uh, remind your client of uh, all the work that's ahead of them and all the work that you didn't do for them. Perfect. Excellent there. Now, I know a gentleman uh, asked a question in chat about writing on components that are working properly at the time of inspection. So let's say, you know, AC units in, in good operative uh, condition. Uh, would we just simply fill out the description like it's an AC unit, maybe it's five years old, uh, you know, 20,000 or 30,000, uh, or actually in this case, say maybe three ton, uh, and that's full stop, right? We just fill out the checklist of the description, or should we then perhaps embellish that a bit more with adding a comment to that, uh, maybe, you know, an overarching comment about, you know, the AC unit appears to be in good operative condition at the time of uh, operation or time of inspection. Would that comment, do you feel it add some value to the report? You know, if maybe you're a more narrative-driven inspector, sort of summarizing the list of items in the description with a comment, if that's sort of your preference on things, would you feel that that adds some value to it? Or uh, what's your take on that? Um, I definitely stay away from that um, for a couple of reasons. One is that it's a waste of the client's time. Um, if you feel compelled, you can say at the beginning of the report um, where no defects were noted, uh, the report will remain silent. We're only going to address issues that we identified. Um, and the other reason is a liability issue. When you say that it is satisfactory, acceptable, operating properly, functioning well, functioning as intended. All of those to me are a red flag to get sued. And one of my favorite examples is you diligently flow all the water in the bathroom, you run the uh, tub spout, you run the shower, and you say everything is functioning adequately in the bathroom, all the plumbing is working. Well, unless you take off your clothes and stand in the shower, you don't know how that shower is going to behave when the water bounces off somebody, runs down behind the soap dish, and uh, causes a problem in the, the wall behind the uh, tile. So you don't know that it's operating properly. When you're looking at an air conditioning system that's operating and it's 70 degrees outside and 70 degrees inside the house, that seems great. But is it going to work when it's uh, 95 degrees outside with 98% relative humidity? 
you don't know that things are adequate. You only know if you find a defect. So I stay away from all of that. It takes more time for the inspector to write it. It takes time for the client to read it, and it doesn't help them, and it increases your liability. Fantastic there. Okay. All right, folks. Well, we've gone through a whirlwind of questions. I really appreciate everyone participating. If anyone does have any last questions about the report writing side of things, please ask them now, as otherwise we will be moving along to our action list segment. Uh, we're just going to do a high-level overview of the action list today. Uh, so we will be covering that in greater detail later on, but we will certainly be addressing that momentarily. Uh, question, what do you think about using the term uh, at the time of inspection? So, you know, you know, at time of inspection, plumbing was functioning adequately, as an example. I, I hate at the time of inspection. Um, I think it's a self-evident. Um, when, what else could it possibly be? Um, it's a lot of words that don't add any value. So I would say, you know, what you observed is what you observed. You couldn't have observed it at a different time than at the inspection. It's the only time you were at the house. Gotcha. Oh, perfect there. All right, folks, I don't see any more questions uh, coming through there. If you maybe want to clarify about the standards one for ASHI, I would be glad to uh, pose that to Mr. Carson there. All right, folks. Well, again, I really appreciate everyone's participation for this part of the Q&A period. And again, thank you so much, Mr. Carson, for your participation in this.